Hey everybody, how's it going? Hope you're all good. Hope you're all well. Welcome back to another edition of the Chronicles of Aguna, the Arsenal podcast, part of, of course, the 90 Min Football family. This is a pre-recorded edition. Um, I did plan on recording two episodes this Monday. I planned on recording a bonus one in the morning, looking back on that game between Liverpool and Manchester City. Of course, the two of them played out a draw, which is great for Arsenal in terms of keeping us top of the Premier League for now. And I plan to do a separate preview podcast looking ahead to that huge, huge game coming up tomorrow night at Emirates Stadium. But unfortunately, this morning I woke up to some really, really bad news. Um, A dear family member passed away, sadly, um, early hours of the morning. And so to be quite honest, I just wasn't in the mood um, to sit down and record back-to-back podcasts. I just I just didn't feel like it. It's why I wasn't on the 90 Min show this morning as well. A lot of people have messaged me. Thank you for the messages asking me why I wasn't on. Um, it's not because I was celebrating hard that Liverpool and Manchester City had played out a draw and that meant that Arsenal were going to stay top of the league. It was because I woke up to some horrible news um, and I felt that I needed to be with family today and spend time with the family. And that was more important. So that's why you haven't got two podcasts. That's why this episode is not live, because I didn't know how I'd feel once I started this podcast. I didn't know if I'd want to do or be able to do a whole live stream without any um, sort of interruptions or pauses. So I decided instead I'm going to pre-record the show and I can edit out what I want to edit out and I can pause it when I want to pause it. And if I don't want to put it out at all, then I don't have to put it out full stop. Um, so that's why we're not live this evening. And um, and I'm sure uh, you guys will all understand. On a more positive note, um, Manchester City and, uh, and Liverpool played out a draw. And um, what a draw it was. I thought the game was was incredible. Everything about it was really, really special. The intensity, the quality on display, um, and I said to you guys in the lead up to our game at the weekend that as long as we did our job, I would sort of be comfortable in sort of sitting back, putting my feet up and just taking this one in as a football consumer, if you like. And um, and the game didn't disappoint. I have to say, when I saw Liverpool's lineup, I was worried for them. Um, not that I really care about what happened to the Liverpool, but in the sense of I worried that it was going to be really one-sided and I worried that City were going to have way too much uh, for them. And I thought in the first half, there were periods where Manchester City's superior quality showed, particularly early on in the game where they created some real good openings on the counter-attack. Obviously, they took the lead through John Stone's really good set-piece routine there. I wonder if they've been uh, watching Nicholas Yova's work and have taken a bit of inspiration from that. Who knows? Um, and then, of course, Liverpool equalised at the start of the second half with a penalty kick. Moment of madness from Edison, really. But Nathan Ake sold him short. You know, it was Ake's back pass that was just not good enough. I think it was Ake. Correct me if I'm wrong. I'm pretty sure it was. I'm blaming the wrong guy, maybe. Um, but it was clearly too short. And that allowed Darwin Nunez in there. Um, and I, I just thought that Edison as kind of Gary Neville said in commentary, might have been a little bit smarter there and sort of come out full steam as if he was going to make a challenge and then sort of having realised maybe halfway, three quarters of the way there, that he wasn't going to get there first. He might have just sort of paused, pulled out a little bit and looked to jockey the player um, and, and, you know, produce a block maybe. I don't know. Um, But he didn't. He went full swinging with that left boot. He ended up getting injured and having to come off. And I don't know what the extent of that injury is at this moment in time and whether that means that Manchester City will be without him 
I thought although Liverpool struggled at points in the first half, you know, and they they created their own bits and pieces in the first half as well. That's not to say that it was completely one-way traffic. I thought their second half performance was outstanding. And whatever you say about Liverpool, whatever you say about Jurgen Klopp and this side, and I've said in recent weeks that I don't think that what they are doing currently is sustainable because of the number of injuries, because of how many key players they've got missing. You know, they shut me up yesterday with that display and that performance. They didn't get the three points that they wanted, obviously, but they should have. They really, really should have. Luis Diaz was outstanding in every department of the game. He was just lacking the finish when it really, really mattered. And um, that'll be really, really frustrating for Jurgen Klopp and the Liverpool fans. But I think what will be even more frustrating is the fact that they believe and feel like they should have been awarded a penalty in stoppage time. I've watched this back over and over and over again. And I think the way people are kind of interpreting this incident and the way people have tried to break it down, it, it's kind of like, well, it's either really, really dangerous and reckless or he got the ball. And actually, you can do both, right? So Jeremy Doku does get a foot on the ball. And I'm not a fan of those still images that are going around on social media that show Doku's follow through, for example, after he's kicked the ball. If you pause it at the right point, it looks like he's literally just kung fu kicked the Liverpool player in the chest. There are other images that show him kicking the ball away. There are some that don't. And, you know, that's the problem with still images in these incidents. My kind of interpretation of it is he does get to the ball first. He does get something on the ball, Jeremy Doku. But that is still a challenge that probably anywhere on the pitch gets penalised as being dangerous. And it's a challenge that you more often than not get pulled up for. So I completely understand why Liverpool fans, why Jurgen Klopp, um, you know, are all looking at that and going, what on earth do we need to do to get a penalty or what on earth needs to happen these days to get a penalty kick? I think it was just one of those things where it was too big a call at that stage in the game, given how finely balanced it was and nobody wanted to be the guy that made that decision. When I saw the replay the first time around, I thought Doku was in serious trouble and I thought, uh-oh, this is it. Now, the result worked out in the end for us, but the point I'm trying to make here is that I think they really, really, really do, Liverpool, have a strong case, um, you know, uh, to, to kind of argue when it comes uh, to that because if that was us on the receiving end of a decision like that, I'd be absolutely livid. What I want to say, though, as well, sort of taking you know, individual incidents out of the equation for a minute and looking at the game on the whole is, am I particularly fearful of either of these two sides? We play Manchester City in a couple of weeks, just over a couple of weeks time. And I look at them and I think they're fallible and I think they're beatable. That doesn't mean that you're going to beat them though, because there are so many things that come into play as we keep discussing nerves, the occasion, the atmosphere. And it's going to be um, obviously at the Etihad and although people say that the Etihad isn't the most atmospheric ground in the Premier League, and I agree with that, by the way, I was there last season when they completely battered us towards the end of the campaign, ultimately put the final nail in the coffin of our sort of um, Premier League title hopes. And I thought the atmosphere that night was really, really good. So they can produce it when they need to. And, you know, it, at, at this point in the season and given... They're the ones that have been there and done it. And we're almost the pretenders, if you like, until we actually conquer them and, and conquer them in terms of actually taking their title away from them. It's not just about whether or not you have the talent, because we know we have the talent. We know we have the quality. We know we have the players. We know we have a manager who knows them inside out um, and has also proven himself, I think, on many occasions this season to be able to produce and then see his players execute really good complex game plans and that's where Arteta's improved for me it's one of the the, the the sort of areas in which he's dramatically improved can we beat them yeah will we I don't know we're going to have to find out but it's really important now that we put the Premier League on ice because we are where we are we're top it's a confidence boost great happy days the table looks really pretty at the moment take as many screenshots of it as you possibly can but our attention does have to turn to FC Porto and the task that we have ahead of us because I don't think this is going to be easy. We'll talk about that game in a little bit. 
Um, I just don't think it's going to be easy. But I did want to kind of wrap up on the Premier League title talk by highlighting uh, something that um, Charles Watts posted a little bit earlier on on Monday. I thought this was really, really interesting. Although the weekend went the way it did and Arsenal sort of gained the advantage over the other two because they were playing each other and Arsenal managed to get a late winner against Brentford, making sure that they took maximum points from that game. Arsenal are still viewed as the least likely to win the Premier League title. And there's an interesting graphic here that takes into consideration the Opta analysts sort of chance percentages of Manchester City, Liverpool and Arsenal winning the league before and after match day 28, which is what we've just had. So before match day 28, so before this weekend, Manchester City's chances were at 51.4%. Liverpool's were at 35.6% and Arsenal's were at 13%. Arsenal's chances have jumped up by 5.8%. So it's now 188 when you look at Arsenal's chances of winning the Premier League this season, according to the Opta analyst. So there's been some jump there, a jump of about 5%. Manchester City have lost about 5%. Their chances now stand, according to this, at 45.9%. Liverpool's have only marginally changed. Their chances have reduced by 0.3%. So after match day 28, it looks like this. Manchester City, 45.9%. Liverpool, 35.3%. Arsenal, 18.8%. Would you have thought that given the fact that we pulled the win out of the bag and those two drew, that this would look different? I I still make that about right. All right, I might have pushed Arsenal's chances up to 20%, but I still make that right. And the reason I still make that right is not because I don't believe in this team. It's not because I don't believe in the players that we've got. It's because we've got some really difficult games still to play and we've got some difficult away trips against sides that would be desperate Tottenham Hotspur not mentioning any names to stop us they'll be desperate 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 to throw a spanner in the works for us so yeah just wanted to highlight that because I thought that was really really interesting going to take a short pause and then we're going to turn our attention to that game against FC Porto um oh man I'm looking forward to it. I really, really am. But I was a bag of nerves on around about 75 minutes against Brentford the other day. And I don't know if I can deal with that feeling again in the coming days. But hey, um, we'll focus on that game right after this. Welcome back to the Chronicles of Aguna, the Arsenal podcast, part of the 90 Min Football family. As ever, I'm your host, Harry Simeon. OK, we're talking Arsenal versus FC Porto. And we've got some updates ahead of that game. Uh, at the time I'm recording this, Mikel Arteta um, hasn't given his press conference. I'm sure um, it's going to come really, really shortly. Um, and, and it'll probably be done by the time this gets released, just because my days and my calendar, as I've explained at the beginning of the show, is just a little bit all over the place right now. Uh, but a couple of updates that I wanted to discuss. First of all, um, concerning Gabriel Martinelli. Now, I'm pretty sure that Mikel Arteta won't rule out Gabriel Martinelli based on what he said to me after the Brentford game, where he said, we're really, really hopeful. We're going to see how it goes, et cetera, et cetera. And we know that Mikel Arteta likes to keep these things uh, close to his chest. Gabriel Martinelli was seen by Tom Canton and he reported it the other day, leaving Emirates at the weekend on crutches, which didn't look good. We were told that it was a cut, um, but the Athletics say, uh, Gunnar Blog's piece says that Gabriel Martinelli will miss Arsenal's Champions League game against Porto on Tuesday due to a foot injury. And given that, in my opinion, and again, feel free to disagree in the comments, Leandro Trossard didn't play all that well against Brentford for large periods, I would be tempted to make a change there. And we'll talk about what that change might be uh, in a little while. Another piece of news um, on the injury front is uh, the earlier today, uh, when the team were filmed uh, making their way out onto the training pitch, the, those uh, covering, uh, of course, the training session, um, you know, very, very quick to report that Takahiro Tomiyasu was back in training and he was there alongside Yuri and Timber. And it looks like he's getting a nice warm welcome there from his teammates, Yuri and Timber, Mikel Arteta 
getting involved in the banter as well, which is good to see. But look, he's going to be a really important player for us as well in the running because as good as Kivior's been, there are certain games where I'd prefer to see Tom Yassi playing at left back. Man City away would be one of them. But obviously, with the lack of games between now and then, it's going to be really difficult to build Tommy Asu's minutes back up. So do you just stick with what you have and what you know has been working of late? It's not like our defensive numbers have suffered with Kivi or in the side. It's not like I see him as a liability. And I do think he's got better and better uh, at left back as time's gone on. But this is Manchester City away. And there is a part of me that would, I think, still... And I know he's been out for a while and I know that Kivio's come on leaps and bounds, but there is a part of me that still would trust Takahiro Tomiyasu with that particular specific task more, which is mad when you think that not that long ago, he basically played that short back pass, which Kevin De Bruyne got on the end of and lobbed Aaron Ramsdale. Do you remember last season at Emirates Stadium? But hey, um, yeah. Uh, good to see him back nonetheless and back in the picture. Will he be ready for tomorrow? Highly, highly doubt it unless he's been training and we just didn't know about it. But I think that's unlikely. Then the Manchester City game is what? 17, 18, 19 or days away. So, yeah, there's plenty of time, isn't there, um, for them to build him up fitness wise. But unless there's a behind closed doors friendly or something like that, or he gets to play on international duty, if that happens, then you know, when is the time and, and where is the time? Where is the opportunity to kind of build him right back up? OK, um, also interesting to note that um, the referee uh, for the game against Porto, as pointed out by now Arsenal, looks a spitting image of Leandro Trossard. <laughs> Maybe he'll do us a favour. Uh, Liga and referee Clement Turpin will take charge of Arsenal's UEFA Champions League tie against FC Porto on Tuesday. We're going to need a strong referee. We're going to need a referee um, who is going to stamp out some of their antics because we know they're going to come with them. We know they're going to bring them. We know they're going to provide them. We know, you know, we, we've just played Brentford and we've been talking for the last couple of days about gamesmanship and running down the clock and how little the ball was in play, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, we, we're going to need a referee that is on top of that. And European referees tend to let, you know, tend to, to sorry, I was going to say tend to let more go. They don't. They, they tend to go the other way in comparison to Premier League referees when it comes to the physical challenges. But hopefully he'll take no nonsense when it comes to all of the other stuff that I expect um, to experience from FC Porto on Tuesday. Look, they're going to do, um, they're going to do what they need to do. They're going to do, um, what they think is the best thing to give them a chance of holding on to that lead and progressing through to the knockout stages. That's just how it goes. But just on the point of refereeing, I did take a screenshot of this last night and I wanted to share it with you. Um, I haven't got this on the screen to be able to share, but I'll just read it out. We were talking about how little the ball was in play against Brentford. The ball was only in play for 49 minutes and 26 seconds. If you go back and you find the last or, or the five games in the Premier League this season in which the ball was in play for the least time, Arsenal's two fixtures against Brentford make the top five. In third place was Brentford versus Arsenal at the GTEC when Kai Havertz scored the late winner. 49 minutes and eight seconds. This time around, it was 49 minutes and 26 seconds. So there's clearly a desire and a willingness on Brentford's part to do that. They did it very, very well to their credit. And I don't blame them for trying it or executing it. I blame the officials for not stamping it out quicker. But we need a referee that's going to be on top of that kind of stuff, I think, um, of course, uh, tomorrow night. And hopefully Clement Turpin um, is the man. It's been so long since we've been in the Champions League that I don't even remember which referees I like, which referees I don't like. I don't pay as much attention when it's not uh, involving Arsenal. But yeah, I thought I'd just highlight that bit of humour there from now Arsenal. Very, very good. Really, really enjoyed that. Not going to sit and go into massive depth about FC Porto. We talked about them in the lead up to the first leg. We discussed what it is that they bring to the table, the players to watch. And I think we learned a little bit more as well from that game that we saw at the Dragao um, last month. But um, I do want to share with you guys uh, the starting lineup uh, stuff because 
as I mentioned a little bit earlier on, I didn't feel like Leandro Trossard was that good um, in the game against Brentford. And, you know, is it that he's not as effective from the left as he is from other positions? Maybe. Is it that he just had an off night? Maybe. We talk a lot about him coming in and out of the side and that can't always be easy. Um, I don't know. But knowing what we're going to face, knowing the way they're going to set up, the shape they're going to set up with, the fact that they're going to try and absorb as much as they can. I really feel like we need dribblers. And although Leandro Trossard is a talented dribbler, he is someone that cuts inside a little bit earlier than Gabriel Martinelli does normally um, because he isn't that kind of get your head down, get to the byline kind of guy. I worry that in this game, that's what Porto will want. They'll want to kind of shepherd you into an area where they're better set up to defend. And I think that somebody like Leandro Trossard and he'll probably go on to be the match winner now, and I hope he is. But somebody like Leandro Trossard probably wouldn't be my first choice in this particular fixture. There's someone else I'd use on the left wing, given that we uh, understand Martinelli's been ruled out. And that would be um, this man, Gabriel Jesus. I would play Gabriel Jesus from the left-hand side. I think he's really, really effective from the flanks, Gabby Jesus. I know he doesn't want to play there. I know that's part of the reason that he wanted to leave Manchester City. We heard all of that chat. Um, didn't we, before his uh, departure and after his arrival at Arsenal, a big selling point to him about joining Arsenal and Mikel Arteta was this idea that he'd return to his preferred position at centre forward. But sometimes you've got to help the team. And Gabriel Jesus is more than willing, I'm sure, to do that. I just think sort of him dribbling and trying to get to the byline um, and sort of, you know, we know how good he is when it comes to linking up with people. You know, if he can combine with Havertz, if, you know, they can, sort of play really, really close to each other. If Bukayo Saka can hold that width on the right-hand side and then Odegaard and Rice, for example, can get up along in support and make that front five that we always talk about, then I think we've got a really, really good chance in front of our fans, in front of our own supporters. Mikel Arteta keeps talking about the noise. He keeps saying, bring the noise, and we absolutely have to do that tomorrow. I think this could be the way to go. So for those of you listening on audio, my team to face uh, FC Porto tomorrow night would be David Raya in goal. White, Saliba, Gabriel and Kivior across the back. Jorginho, Odegaard and Rice in the midfield with Jesus, Havertz and Saka as the front three. Jesus playing on the left-hand side. In terms of a prediction, I'm going to go for Arsenal 2, FC Porto nil, And that would be enough uh, to see us through to the quarterfinals for the first time in what? 14, 15 years? I think it's 14 years. Oh, I just, I'm desperate to see it happen. And I think if we can manage that, it will mark a really, really significant week in our season. Going back to the top of the Premier League, taking advantage of the fact that our two title rivals were playing against one another. I know Liverpool will be in that position next week, but as long as you take your chances, there's not really that much else you can do, right? You just don't want to live with that regret. So we've done that. And if we can get through in the Champions League in a tie that we were very, very fancied in going into, um, but the first leg didn't really go our way. Look, people criticised us for the first leg and said that we didn't play very well and uh, and we didn't have a shot on target for the first time in like two years, which was absolutely spot on. The criticism was fair. The criticism was valid. What I would say, though, is this. The goal that Porto scored, it wasn't coming. It's not like they had us pinned up against the wall when they were bombarding us and bombarding us and bombarding us. And it was only a matter of time before they got what they deserved. That wasn't the case at all. Arsenal, despite being toothless, blunt in attack and all of the rest of it, managed to control Porto really, really well. And it was just a really good goal out of nowhere. Criticised the goalkeeper a little bit after it because I thought he could have done better if he moved his feet a little bit quicker. But that was me being kind of like, really picky and fussy and like micro analyzing it. So for those of you that have given me stick over the last 24 hours for my comments on Ramsdale the other night, um, I'm consistent in that. Like it's it, it's not because it was Ramsdale that I was sort of really analyzing his every kind of step and move there. Um, I think we'll have enough. I think we'll be okay. Um, but it's the Champions League and you can't take anything for granted. I thought we'd be okay when we played sporting in the Europa last year and look what happened. We got undone by a wonder goal. Um, and um, yeah, our European campaign ended there. And I hope that's not the case tomorrow because what you don't want is when you're riding on a crest of a wave and momentum is a big part of why you are where you are. You don't want that momentum to be killed by going out 
um, obviously, um, because that, although it doesn't have any impact on the Premier League title race, it does have a knock-on effect. Arsenal will have to sit and stew over that for, you know, 19 days until they play Manchester City. It's not like we have a Premier League game at the weekend again, where we can try and kind of get back tunnel vision, focus on that, go and win that and sort of put the Champions League exit to bed. That opportunity is not there for us to rectify any wrongs. So we have to make sure there are no wrongs uh, tomorrow night. Thank you uh, so much for bearing with me uh, on this uh, pre-recorded episode of the Chronicles of Agun. It's not quite the same and it's much shorter without the live chat because I haven't got anybody to bounce off of. Um, but I appreciate you guys tuning in as always. If you could leave a like on the video, I'd really, really appreciate it. If you could subscribe to the channel, I'd really, really appreciate it. And if you're listening on audio, please do leave us a review. We'll be back on Wednesday morning uh, with the uh, Porto reaction. We might bring you an episode tomorrow, uh, depending on uh, what the news cycle looks like. But until then, take care of yourselves. Have a great day. All the best and uh, up the Arsenal. Goodbye. (laughs) 